<coughs> now, the question is, which particular damn soul is going to follow that tale of fantasy? Cesarina! Ches ah, Cesarina, there you are. <coughs> Who is next to regale us with a tale of terror? Take your time. Fate has eternity in which to choose. <coughs> Who in this audience is next to tell us, sir? Me. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if this <laughs> fair audience here is ready for a tale of my own personal horrors. <laughs> so, I think this evening, if I am to tell you a tale, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you the tale of a colleague of mine, a Mr. Edward Valentine. And this is a chapter from my forthcoming novella, which is the sequel to The Nine Deaths of Dr. Valentine, published by Spectrum Press. And this is called The Hammer of Dr. Valentine, and in this my anti-hero murders Daily Mail reporters. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I told you you were on show <laughs> He murders Daily Mail reporters in the style of Hammer horror film. <laughs> if you're not too familiar with <coughs> Pantheon, but this is the Fear in the Night chapter, for those of you who aren't familiar with this. <laughs> is it much further? Michael Brennan mopped his forehead as he followed the girl down the dirt track, doing his best to keep his eyes off parts of her anatomy that a man of his age could probably go to prison for staring at, much less touching these days. Of course, it would help if she wasn't wearing the kind of school uniform you could have sworn went out of fashion in the 1950s, <laughs> complete with a straw boater, tightly buttoned blue blazer, and skirt, the shortness of which he was sure he had described as one of the reasons our country's in the state it is now. <laughs> in an article of his on declining moral standards in one of the more popular tabloids. Of course, that had been a long time ago, and he'd been the author of a lot more outraged newsprint since that article about the morally bankrupt state of many of Britain's teenage girls. That was the one that had got him in the door, though. That and the supremely angry column he had provided about the threat to children of both today and tomorrow as a result of the kinds of films they were allowed to watch. If we are not careful, he remembered writing with some degree of pride. <laughs> we are creating, within our midst, a whole generation of Dr. Valentines who would not hesitate to recreate some of the shocking things they have seen on screen, just for kicks. It had helped that he had been the one to cover the original Dr. Valentine affair for the paper as well, making the most of his contacts in the Bristol Police Force to give him the inside facts as well as plenty of gossip and conjecture that he'd been able to weave into a seamless whole to give him his first major set of headlines. But that had been some time ago now, of course, and while the paper had been happy for him to ride on the back of the story's success for a while, he had known it wouldn't last forever. His regular column, Brennan's Britain, had been the answer. <laughs> Ostensibly a look at contemporary culture, He'd been encouraged to use his weekly 1,500-word allocation to express horror at the kinds of things he knew the paper's very specific kind of middle-class, middle-aged readers would be similarly outraged by. Once he had exhausted such old standbys as linking movie violence and crime, immigration with unemployment, and video games with short attention spans, he'd found himself having to try harder to come up with things that would keep his column popular and himself gainfully employed. He hadn't had to look too far for the answer. In fact, he hadn't had to look any further than the trunk he kept in his own attic. The one with three padlocks on that all required different combinations to get them open. He'd always been worried that it might get discovered one day, and so, embracing the philosophy that the best defence is a good offence, Michael Brennan had become a crusader against pornography. <laughs> the pleasant and thoroughly unexpected side effect of this had been discovering that 
Having a serious moral objection to such material also happened to be the best way of acquiring it. <laughs> Some of his more enthusiastically horrified readers had directed him to the very best outlets, establishments, and websites that purveyed the sickening material he was determined to expose for the nation's safety. Soon, he found himself having to buy another trunk with the extra money. <laughs> And that one was nearly full now as well. In fact, if he acquired any more specialist research material, he was going to have to think seriously about moving house. And this girl he was currently following might just lead him to the story that would bag him the funds to buy it. He could remember the letter she'd sent him two weeks ago, almost word for word. After all, he would use it to kick off the article he was intending to write. An article that would portray her as one of the poor, helpless victims that he, crusading journalist Michael Brennan, had saved by exposing the immoral faith that was taking place, and worse, being filmed at one of Britain's more out-of-the-way public schools. Of course, what she put in her letters could also turn out to be nonsense, which is why he'd agreed to meet her at the very place where she claimed that these events were happening. Well, not right out of school. His car was parked in a lay-by on an isolated country road a mile or so back, and he'd walked the rest of the way, meeting her at the main entrance to the school by a pair of heavy iron gates painted green. They'd also be blocked. It's the holidays, she'd explained. Don't you have kids of your own? Brennan had shaken his head, suddenly embarrassed that she thought of him old enough to be her father. If that's the case, why are you dressed like that? He'd asked. A coquettish smile. Because I've said I'll be in one of the films, she said. <laughs> and whispered conspiratorially. Term's only just ended, and my parents aren't expecting me back for another week. So I thought it would be the perfect time for us to work on this story together. <laughs> Brennan had groaned internally at her words. So that was it. She wanted her name on the piece too. Well, she was about to get her first hard lesson in the world of journalism, he thought this came to anything. The way into the school grounds was through a much smaller gate further along. It led onto a dirt track that she'd explained was only used by the school gardener. Well, he's sober enough to drive that little cart of his, she giggled. Now they'd been walking for nearly a quarter of an hour, and there was still no sign of anything remotely resembling the school. Nearly there, said the girl, skipping ahead as if daring him to chase after her, which he duly did, if only not to lose sight of where they were supposed to be going. Rounded a corner there in <coughs> school. Brennan's first impression was, be to, was to be distinctly underwhelmed. It looks more like an old manor house, he said. The girl shook her head. It's nowhere near as old as it looks, or as old as its owners would like people to think. It's like a reproduction. My daddy calls it Stockbroker Tudor, whatever that means. <laughs> Brennan wasn't sure either, but he made a point of remembering the phrase for his writer. It's very quiet, he said looking at the empty car park and the litter blowing across the deserted cricket pitches. Of course it is, said the girl. I told you, term finished last week. Now come on. The school's main doors were unlocked, and she led him into a high ceiling hallway with a pine floor so polished Brennan almost slipped. The wood panelling of the walls came up to waist height and had been painted a pale green. The white plaster above was all but obscured by numerous pin boards with green velvet backgrounds documenting sporting fixtures and arrangements for end-of-term prize-giving. Brennan nodded. If the locked gates and empty grounds had given him any doubts about this place being a real school, they were gone now. Only a madman would go to this level of detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've convinced me this is a school, he said, trying hard not to leer at the girl. She'd unbuttoned her blazer now, she was inside in the warm, and her white blouse was under a pleasurable degree of tension. <laughs> now what? <coughs> now you stay here and you wait for my signal, she said, skipping off down the corridor. Her regulation school shoes clattered on the wood as she rounded a corner, the sound of her footsteps vanishing as soon as she did. Brennan assumed the form must be carpeted around there and settled down to wait. <clears throat> he wondered what her signal might be. Would she wait until they started filming? Or perhaps until she and whoever might be with her, well, you know, doing something his readers might consider morally outrageous. He licked his lips, I hope so. Grateful for the digital camera that was nestling in his jacket pocket. 
he carried one with him for the past two years because it got him a lot of worthwhile research material in his time. But now, he never travelled without it. <laughs> after 15 minutes, he wondered if she was going to make a signal as well. And after 20, he decided to find out what was going on for himself. He was surprised to discover that the corridor she turned into had the same kind of wooden floor tiles as where he'd been standing, making him wonder why the sound of her footsteps had vanished so abruptly. Perhaps she'd skipped quickly into one of the classrooms here, he thought. He made his way down the passageway, his own footsteps echoing noisily in the empty space until he came to the first door. Set into its own little alcove on the left, the black letters on the anemic green paint read, Mr. K.A. Johnston, Mathematics. Brennan listened at the door, and when he heard nothing, he tried the brass meringue-shaped knob. The door opened noiselessly to reveal the kind of classroom Brennan thought had gone out of style years ago. Twenty open-lid desks of the same polished pine as the floor tiles were arranged in five columns of four, all facing a large wooden table and chair that stood atop a wooden desk. Behind the chair and to the right of it, an easel blackboard the colour of slate was propped on its wooden tripod and held in place by three supporting pegs. There was nothing written on the blackboard, no books on the master's desk and not a soul in the room. Except Brennan, of course. He gave a cough and its echo cracked back at him. At least the girl was telling the truth about it being school holidays, he thought. Although he wondered what kind of pupils kept their desks so spotlessly clean, the lids unblemished by even the slightest suggestion of biro etched graffiti or an ink-splattered fountain pen mishap. The classroom of Mr. J. N. Partleton, English, was a little further down the corridor on the right, it was arranged in the same way as Mr. Johnson's, and it, too, was empty. You'd think they'd at least have some textbooks scattered around, Brennan thought, before realising the pupils probably had to buy their own and bring them along to lessons. The next room on the left belonged to Mr. M. V. Bradbrook, taught geography. Brennan expected to see at least a globe or some maps on the walls, but the room was the same empty place of learning as the others. He was about to give the final room in the corridor, the last door on the right, a miss, when there was a sound from behind it. Brennan read the name on the door. Mr. M. Carmichael, Classics. Good God, did they still teach Latin and Greek these days? Brennan put his ear to the door. Yes, there was definitely something going on in there. It was faint, but as he concentrated, he thought he could make out words. No, not words. <clears throat> Chanting. <laughs> Boys' voices, chanting <coughs> Latin. Increasingly furious at the thought that his time was being wasted, Brennan yanked open the door to confront the Latin summer school or whatever the hell it was. The classroom was empty. But that was impossible. He'd heard them. Brennan strode inside and looked around. The room was like all the others. No books, no teachers, no pupils. Nothing. The voices had stopped now as well. In fact, Brennan realised they'd stopped as soon as he'd come through the door. Ah! I see we have a new pupil in the class. Brennan whirled to see a figure standing in the doorway, a figure clad in a worn, dark suit. A pocket watch had been tucked into the fraying pocket of the man's waistcoat. The mortarboard had seen better days as well and the teacher's gown had smears of chalk dust here and there from times when the blackboard rubber had probably been hidden by an especially mischievous pupil or misplaced in a moment of absent-mindedness. This new arrival peered at Brennan through a pair of tiny rimless spectacles. Vision through the circular lenses must have been almost entirely obscured by the myriad tiny splintered cracks in the glass. Nevertheless, Mr. Carmichael, if it was he, seemed to have no trouble seeing Brennan. Well, answer me, boy, he said, taking a step forward and closing the door behind him. I don't know where you were before, but here, if a master asks you a question, you answer promptly, politely, and respectfully. Brennan was so shocked he found himself momentarily lost in the words. Who, who the hell are you? He eventually managed to stammer. Oh, my, said Mr. Carmichael. That won't do. That won't do at all. 
In the corner by the door was what looked like an umbrella stand, but instead it housed a collection of very thin walking sticks. <laughs> Carl Michael took a step to his left, and as he drew one out, Brennan realised they weren't walking sticks at all. They were canes. I can see we're going to have to teach the new boy a lesson, said Carl Michael to no one that Brennan could see. He gave the cane a couple of experimental swishes through the air, once to the right and once to the left as if he were preparing for a fencing duel rather than the delivery of corporal punishment. Then he pointed at the table with it. I suggest you make yourself ready, young man. <laughs> Brennan was about to splutter an objection when Carmichael continued. However, I see no reason why the misbehavior of one especially bad apple should ruin this morning's lesson. Boys, continue with what we were doing while I deal with this miscreant. Second declension, begin. Carmichael pressed a switch near the door. Suddenly, the air around Brennan was filled with boys' voices, almost as if the classroom had become home to a Latin lesson for ghosts. Dominus, domine, dominum, the boys chanted as Carmichael advanced, the cane held high. Now he was closer, Brennan could see the tiny razor-sharp steel points that had been fitted along the length of the brass If he was hit with that, it would open him up like a pig being gutted. Domini, domino, domino, the voices chanted as Brennan held up his hand. Now look, he said, I'm sorry I'm trespassing, but I was led here under false pretenses. I'm a journalist, and the cane descended, tearing into both of Brennan's outstretched palms. He screamed and took two steps back. Domini, domini, dominos, said the boys. For God's sake, he screamed as Carmichael pursued him, the man raising his cane to deliver another blow. I haven't done anything wrong. Oh, I wouldn't say that said Carmichael. With a flick of the wrist, he ripped open Brennan's right cheek, then the left, finishing off by making a deep gouge across the man's forehead. Dominorum, Dominis, Dominis, came the voices over the speakers as Brennan fell to his knees, blood streaming down his face. The chanting stopped as the man who'd been beating him removed his spectacles. In fact, I'd say you've been a bad boy, he said, bringing his face close to Brennan's own beaten features. A very very bad boy indeed. Through bloodstained vision, Brennan looked into the face of the man who, for no reason, had decided to torment him. And then he realised that the man actually had a very good reason indeed. Valentine, he croaked, <laughs> his face quaking with fear. He spat blood onto the otherwise spotless floor. Oh my God! Not quite, said Edmund Valentine. But certainly someone said to show you the uh, error of your ways. He raised the cane for yet another attack, and then paused as he looked into the middle distance. That's very good, boys, he said. Now, the third declension. Silence. Oh, of course, said Valentine with a smile to the weeping mess that Brennan had become. I have to change the tape, excuse me. <laughs> as his tormentor went over to the doorway, Brennan realised this might be his only chance to escape. He pushed himself to his feet, bent his head down, and, ignoring the dripping blood pooling on the floor, cannoned his body towards the door. Valentine pushed another button. As Brennan found himself in the corridor, more boys' voices surrounded him, coming from the speakers that had been set into the ceiling at regular intervals. Rex, Rex, Regem, the voices said as Brennan staggered towards the exit. He turned and through a bloody mist saw a caped figure close behind him. Regis, Regi, Regé, the boys chanted. Brennan ran back the way he'd come and quickly found himself in the open air. Regais, 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 came the voices from all around him, from the speaker set into the trees, into the walls of the building, from everywhere he looked. No escape for naughty boys, said Valentine from behind him, and you, Mr. Brennan, are a very naughty boy indeed. From behind one of the trees that skirted the tennis courts appeared the girl who had first enticed him here. She waved to him. Come on, she called, her tone urgent. This way. Regum, regibus, regibus, said the boys on the tape, concluding their latest task. Brennan had no time to think, and so he ran towards her, under the horizontal tree branch that arched ten feet over her head, and straight into the hangman's noose she'd looped over his head and tightened around his neck. What are you doing? he said in choked tones as the girl backed away, leaving Brennan tethered by the rope that had been strung over the branch above him. She's doing what she was asked, Mr. Brennan, said Valentine, coming up to the hapless journalist and raising the cane once more. Now, can you remember the Latin for to love or to like? Brennan started to cry, the mixture of blood and tears obscuring his vision entirely for a moment as he desperately tried to avoid another flogging. 
Ammo, he said eventually between sobs. Ammo, it's ammo. Valentine tutted. I would have hoped that a man of your age and presumed education would have at least been able to present the verb in the classically accepted manner. He raised the cane as the man before him struggled. Allow me to refresh your memory. The Latin verb for to like or to love is ammo, I love. He whipped the back of Brennan's neck. Amare, to love, another slash across the face. Amarvi, I have loved, a hard blow across the back of the knees to cause Brennan to collapse. And finally, Amartus, which is... Brennan didn't know, or he was bleeding too much to be able to answer. Valentine took hold of the end of the rope that had been coiled around the hook screwed into the back of the tree trunk. He unwound it and began to pull. The journalist was yanked to his feet, then to tiptoe, and then into the air. The supine stem, Valentine said as he pulled the rope still further. Brennan, coughing, choking, his eyes watering, pulled at the constriction around his neck as he rose higher and higher. Once he was satisfied, Valentine wound the rope around the hook once more before making his way round so the dying journalist could see him. I hope your education here this afternoon will allow you to at least understand me, Mr. Brennan, when I say, no me te amo. No me te amo one little bit. <laughs> Dr. Valentine and his companion watched Brennan's death throes together. Once he was satisfied that the journalist was dead, Valentine turned to the young lady beside him. I think that concludes our lesson for today, he said. She smiled back at him as he added, and now I think the tea on the lawn. They walked away from the hanging body of Michael Brennan, the man's torn face a mask of blood, his eyes glazed in death, hung out to dry like so many of those whom his column had shamefully and needlessly destroyed over the years, but would no longer.